Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm really pleased to have been invited here to join such an illustrious uh, panel of uh, speakers. The victim's perspective on, uh, on an agenda that often, I think, is too offender-focused. 99% of everything we do, everything we say, everything we fund, every service delivery organization is focused on the offender. There just isn't enough focus on what victims want, what victims need, and how we need to respond to victims. So I'm going to attempt to do some of that. Because it's my experience that it's, you know, it's often assumed that victims and their representatives don't have a lot to say about prison. The case that I want to put forward to you today is that a stronger link between prisons and the community must go hand in hand with better engagement with victims. And this builds on much of what I think was the essence of what Nims was saying earlier. And that if it doesn't, we will miss a key opportunity to achieve three outcomes which I am sure we all desire, namely the full rehabilitation of prisoners, an improved experience for victims of crime, and a community that is confident the justice system is doing the job that they require it to do. And I believe effective rehabilitation must mean equipping prisoners with the skills they need to be a functional part of community. It's obvious that this means going way beyond education and training, even though these are important ways to anchor prisoners back into the normal life after they leave. But it also means prisoners taking responsibility for their actions so they don't offend again. So starting at the beginning then, what do we think victims actually want prison to do? Well, probably more than you think. Just after I started as Chief Executive of Victim Support in 2010, we did some uh, research with victims and witnesses to see what they thought sentencing as a whole should be about. Many did think punishment should be the main purpose of sentencing because, and I quote, they need to pay for what they did. But they were equally clear that this should help to reform offenders rather than be punishment for punishment's sake, which alas is often the case. The common view was that the outcome of sentencing should be that the offender does not commit the crime again. One victim even had doubts about whether prisons could deliver the right kind of punishment at all. And I quote, he said, I'd rather see a system where they may not go to prison, but you're damn sure that they're made aware of the effects of whatever they've done has had on victims. That's more productive than sticking them in a room full of other people that are just as bad, if not worse. You should be aiming to punish these people, but you should be punishing them in the most effective way." Unquote. So I can confidently say to you today that Victim Support has an interest in the role, the, community, uh, the role of the community as part of the sentencing regime. It often surprises people to know that we are actually great champions of community sentences too. But we are supportive only if we can really capitalize on their full potential. And alas, that isn't always happening. Often community sentences are seen as a soft option by both victims and the wider public, and the media doesn't help. And perceptions like this do matter, not only because people have the right to feel safe, but because we all know that the criminal justice system can't work if people don't have confidence in it. This is especially true of the victims that the criminal justice system relies on to report crime and see cases through in court. Without them, there would be no justice system. As part of our inquiry, we looked at the intensive alternative to custody model used in Manchester. These uh, IAC orders can last up to two years and have at their heart intensive interventions that occupy the offender five days a week. This goes ha hand in hand with the community outreach service which monitors behavior and enforces compliance seven days a week right around the clock. I don't think anyone who has seen this work would call it a soft option. Indeed, it is rigorous, robust, and compellingly effective. The level of activity required under such programs and the focus on compliance make an alternative to custody a far tougher prospect than prison, we argued. The work will focus on lower level offending for two very good reasons. Firstly, that lower level offenders are more likely to be those committing crimes due to alcohol, drug, and mental health needs and more likely to re-offend than perpetrators of more serious offenses. And secondly, the associated so short-term prison sentences have been shown to perform poorly both in providing rehabilitation and reducing re-offending. So that's our focus, lower level offending. 
So this piece of work will build on what has already been done and will look at what victims want from community alternatives to custody in order to be confident in them as an effective and appropriate form of sentencing. Interestingly, I think it will include how far and in what ways victims want to be involved and informed around the use of community alternatives in sentencing offenders in their own cases. I'll give you two examples. Uh, first, a victim of robbery. An 80-year-old uh, elderly man was robbed on his way home from the post office where he'd collected his pension. He was robbed at knife point. His pension money was stolen as well as his wallet and keys. His main concern was security as his wallet contained his address. The victim had no family living close by who would be able to assist him. We used the prisoner's earnings money to pay for new locks to be fitted which made him, uh, to his home, which made him feel secure. We also provided him with luncheon vouchers so he could purchase some food until he was able to sort out his finances and gave him a personal alarm. Another example, a victim of sexual assault. A 16-year-old girl was raped in her bedroom by a family member. The victim was so distraught, she was unable to sleep in that bed after the incident. Not surprising. Her mother was a single parent who couldn't afford to replace the bed. We purchased a new bed and bedding for the girl and paid for it from prisoner's earnings. We worked with Cardiff Prison to develop the Supporting Offenders Restoratively Inside project, or the SORRY program. This aims to help prisoners come to terms with the damage that they've caused to others, partly through role play and group exercises, and partly through meeting with people who have been victims of crime and the wider community. It's a voluntary week-long course that has been piloted in seven prisons and in time we'd like to see it rolled out to more. An academic paper published last month showed that participants finished the course with enhanced levels of concern for all types of victims, more motivation to change their offending behaviours and more willingness to take responsibility for their actions. We need to be mindful about the use of RJ before sentencing is passed. We have no sensible... Uh, we have no... We have to be sensible about the risks, not only that some offenders may take part in order to get a more lenient sentence, we know that happens, but the agencies involved may end up inadvertently pressurizing victims to serve the rehabilitation agenda. We believe victims should not be taking part in RJ for any other reason than an informed wish to do so. It also has to be an absolute bottom line that RJ is only delivered by trained professionals the possible emotional and psychological damage that could otherwise be caused is not an acceptable risk. But victim-led restorative justice, delivered to a high standard as long as victims feel the time is right for them, could breathe new life into the justice system in a way that's desperately needed. The political will is there. Practitioners are coming together through joint product, projects of the kind I've mentioned, and even the media seems to be taking more of an interest. We should be capitalizing on this by aiming to ensure that no prison in the land where offenders, uh, there is no prison in the land where offenders don't have the opportunity to learn about the harm that crime creates and their responsibility to make some form of amends. For us, the authority of victims when it comes to explaining the impact of crime is second to none. In this respect, victims really are a unique category of people that must be heard. They're also an incredibly diverse one. The victim experience crosses all social divisions to bring millions of people who may be united in nothing else. And too often this diversity is underestimated. Governments, agencies and even the media guess at their needs and views instead of recognizing that they are individuals. Prison regimes can do far more than rehabilitate offenders and improve victims' experiences. They can and should also build community confidence in the justice system. That confidence is not just a good in itself, it is the difference, I believe, between whether people support and help the justice system to work or not. So victim-centered initiatives can bring a value far beyond the financial savings that also stand to be made. Now I hope that uh, what I've said has gone some way in explaining that victims and their representatives have a lot more to say about prison and prisoners than people sometimes realize. Facilitating those conversations is a matter for all of us though, at a national and a local level, inside and throughout our prisons, and at the heart of the public debate on justice. Anything less will be a failure. To us, that's where the community comes in 
and indeed comes into its own. Thank you.